Magnetic fields exert forces on moving charges. Currents are moving charges. So magnetic fields exert forces on currents. All right, first problem, you construct a rail gun, as shown in the problem below, or the picture below. So I'm going to reproduce the picture sort of here, using up all my board space and wondering why I just did that. But you know, planning ahead is for other people. Okay. There's a magnetic field B sticking out of the page. <clears throat> You've got the pair of rails from which the railgun gets its name. And the pair of rails have length D. And then you have the slug, which is length L. So the magnetic field here is D by L. And then you have the rest of the circuit that the thing is connected to. So at the end of the rails, you have out here a current source. That's what that little arrow in a circle implies, a current source. Okay, good. So what this means is there's a current source here. There'll be a current flowing. Now, it won't flow out here because there's an open circuit, not a connect closed circuit. But it will flow, and most importantly, along the slug, it will flow in that direction. I'm having real trouble getting this to stay on my desk. So it'll flow in that direction. Great. And so then what's going to happen is because there's a current moving, that means, well, effectively, there's positive charges moving this way. Really, we know it's electrons moving that way. We'll just think about the positive charges. So I L cross B. So this is the magnetic force on a length of current is I L vector cross B vector. And L vector is the length of the thing and the direction is the direction of the current. That's how you know it's this way and not that way. So I L cross B, so you know there's going to be a force this way. Now it's actually not a force on the bar. If you microscopically look at what's going on, really it's a force, uh, well, so the electrons are that way, um, but then the current, well, it's the direction of the current, that's fine. It's a force on the electrons. The electrons will be pushed to this edge. What it, the magnetic field is really trying to do is make the electrons go around in circles like this. But the ones in here, so everyone that's in here going this way gets pushed up and to the right, tries to go around in a circle, gets to the edge here, can't leave the bar, and so the whole bar gets dragged along by the electrons trying to be pulled along here. So that's great. So the force is going to be that way. What is the magnitude of the force? Well, that's actually pretty easy here. The magnitude of the force, well, it's just ILB. It works here because IL vector is perpendicular to VB vector. So that's the magnitude of the force. That's great. And the question is, how fast is the slug going when it merges at the far side of the railgun? So we assume it starts at rest here. That's the force that way. So let's define x and y as that. If it starts at rest, it's going to have to go distance d. We know that the x is equal to the x0, which is 0, plus v0x, it starts at rest plus one-half AXT squared. So we can use that to figure out how long it takes. And then the speed, VX, is equal to V0X, which is zero, plus AXT. All right, so we're just doing the basic kinematic equations. So we know the total distance it has to go is X, or sorry, is D. That's gonna take one-half AXT squared. And what is AX? Well, by F equals MA. Assuming, do I give you M as the mass of the slug? Yes, I sure do. By F equals MA, AX is just going to be F over M because the force is all in the plus X direction here. So this is going to be AX is F over M, F is ILB, so it's going to be ILB over 2MT squared is equal to D. Well, okay, really what we want is VX, but we don't know T, we do know AX, so VX is equal to ILB over M times t. So I just have to get rid of this t here. So I'll use this to get rid of t. I'll solve for t. t squared is equal to 2md over ilb. Take a square root of both sides. That's what t is. So I get ilb over m times the square root of 2md over ilb. Or if you simplify, so I could pull this inside the square root by making it I squared, L squared, B squared. So inside the square root, I will actually have an ILB on the top, as the squared cancels that. 
I will have an M on the bottom. I'll have a 2 on the top. I'll also have a D on the top. And I'll have an M on the bottom, as this would be M squared and times the square root and cancel one of those. So this is the speed we expect the thing to be going when it reaches the end. Now, let's make sure the units work. So the units I have, I comes in units of coulombs per second, that's amps. L comes in units of meters. B, that one's harder. Remember, that comes in newton seconds per coulomb meter. But then also remember, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So this meter will get canceled with this. And the seconds over second squared becomes that. So that's the Tesla. Then we have a meter for D. And then in the denominator, we have a kilogram. And if we cancel out what's left, kilograms cancel can kilograms, coulombs co cancel coulombs, we have meters squared per second squared, and it's under a square root, so we'll have the right unit. So good, at least the units work on this. I haven't proven that I'm right, I've just failed to prove that I was wrong. If the units didn't work, it would have meant there was a mistake in there somewhere. All right, so that's how fast it is. And then I actually give you some numbers at the end. So if B is one Tesla, I'm gonna write them up here. So one Tesla is a pretty big magnetic field, so big stubbly speakers have them. Uh, the slug has a mass of 20 grams, which is really heavy for a bullet, if you're thinking about making a handheld rail gun to use against your neighbors or whatever you do with them. The barrel of the gun is half a meter long, so that says D equals 0 0.50 meters, and two centimeters wide, so, you know, that's a little rail gun there. So L equals 0 0.0020 meters. And you want the slug to be moving at a speed of Vx equals 1,000 meters per second when all is said and done. What current must you run through the circuit? Well, actually, okay, so here's what the speed is. I really want to solve this for the current. So I'm going to square both sides to get back. So I'll get Vx squared is equal to 2ILBD over M. Solve this for the current. So I multiply both sides by M. I get MVx squared. Divide both sides by 2 L B D, and that will give me the current I need. So now I'm done with this, I'm going to erase this stuff. And I'm going to put these numbers in and we'll see what we get. So M is 0 0.020, so heavy bullet. The muzzle velocity we want, or muzzle speed really, is 1,000 meters per second. That's like three times the speed of sound. That's fast, right? The whole point of a rail to gun is to have things go fast. At least, so I assume, from video games. If video games have taught me anything, it's that rail guns make things go fast. Because nothing in video games is ever unrealistic. Divided by 0.5 meters for L, divided by one Tesla. And remember, a Tesla is a, we just did this, a coulomb, or kilogram per coulomb second is the same as Tesla. That's B, and then divided by D, which is 0 0.002 meters. So if I look at units, kilogram cancels kilogram. Um, uh, 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 meters cancels meters. I have a leftover meters. I'm very distressed by that. No, because I forgot to square this. So the two meters, right, I have to square the 1,000. So the meter squared cancels meters and meters. Um, I'm left with coulombs in the denominator of the denominator, so that's going to be coulombs in the numerator. I have a 1 over second squared divided by 1 over seconds, that's going to be coulombs per second. So good, the units are current units, so I just stick these numbers in my calculator. Ready for this? Are you ready for this? 10 to the 7th. So if you're wondering why we don't just have railguns around to kill your neighbors with, because this is America, you know, we should be able to kill our neighbors. Why don't we have this? Um, if you want to have this high, and all right, so so great, okay. What if we just go a third the speed of sound? And that's not a really stubbly bullet, but suppose the bullet's 100 meters per second. Well, you go from 1,000 to 100, you divide this by 10, but it's squared. This goes from 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 5. 10 to the 7 is 10 million. 10 to the 5 is 100,000. Even then, with that pathetically slow bullet, you know, this is reasonable. Uh, a, I mean, it's a half meter, half meter barrel, so that's like a... I don't know, it's like a little carbine or something. And uh, a, a two centimeter slug width. You know, I chose reasonable numbers here. A pretty studly magnetic field, but you can get them in loudspeakers, so it's not unreasonable. It's just anyway. You need to have ungodly amounts of current. And that's what that's why small handheld rail guns are maybe not the most practical thing in the world. Ten million amps. You know, if I had ten million amps, 
If I had one amp for each of the 10 million things I'm thinking of, I would have 10 million amps. That's the first problem. In the second problem, a square loop of wire that is A on a side, so it's a square A by A, has current I running through it, so the current goes all the way around the loop, and is in a magnetic field B that is perpendicular to two of the legs of the wire and starts at an angle theta with respect to the other two sides of the current. What is the torque on the loop of current? So this we saw this in class, where it was actually lined up, but now we're going to start with a, some other theta. If the loop starts with theta between 0 and 90 degrees, describe how the loop will move in the future. So, okay, interesting. Now, I can start trying to draw it and trying to explain the projection, but hopefully it'll be a little easier if I start with the computer animation here. So what we've got is all the brown arrows here represent the magnetic field everywhere in space. You see the X, Y, and Z axes, so the X is sort of out of the page, but we're full 3D here. And there's the square loop, and there's the angle theta between B, which is the Z direction, and the front and the back legs. So you see the top and bottom legs are not theta. Okay, magnetic field B is up, sorry, across the current, QV or IL, across B, and there's the force on this front leg is that direction. And if you go here, now the current is this way, IL cross B, the force is in that direction. So the force here will also point towards the center of the loop, and there it is. All right, so if you look at both of these forces, they're both pointing opposite each other. What's more, here are the lever arms for these two forces. Notice the lever arms are parallel from the center of the loop to where the force acts, are parallel or anti-parallel to the forces, so there will be no torque from either of these forces. They, they try to squish the thing in, and that's all they do. So we can forget about those forces. So let's look at the top here, IL cross B. That's going to be a force in that direction, in the plus Y direction in this case. And uh, okay, so now we should go look at the bottom loop. Oh, we should think about the torque here. So there's the lever arm. The angle here is 90 degrees minus theta, right? That's between vertical and that side is theta. So between horizontal and that side is 90 degrees minus theta. Remember that, that angle will become important later. Good, okay, so, but there will be a torque here because the lever arm's not parallel. And let's look at the bottom, see if it cancels out. So here we have IL that way, cross uh, B is up, so this is gonna be a torque in the minus Y direction. And notice everything's perpendicular here, so magnitudes would be nice. There's a the lever arm, there's the torque. And if you turn it around and look, you see actually we're going to get a torque that's gonna try and rotate the whole thing more towards vertical. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is pause there and actually work out some of this on the board. So we've seen enough to know that um, if you have the 3D loop like this, um, this front side and this back side don't matter. All that matters is this side here, which we had going into the board, and this side here coming out, right? So there's also the loop. So my square is like doot, 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 okay? That's the square. The um, Magnetic field is all in this direction, just like we saw it, but we're looking at a 2D projection now. Okay, that's good. And then the IL cross B, oh, I did it backwards, sorry. It was into the page at the top, or in the minus X direction, it's in the plus X. So the axes that I have, that's X, that's Z, and this is Y, and we should make sure X cross Y is Z. Yes, it's a good right-handed coordinate system. Okay, so here we have IL cross B. This force is going to be in this direction, and this force is going to be in that direction, right? Sticking out IL cross B that way. Good. Okay, so those are the forces. The magnitudes of both forces will be exactly the same because it's the same I, it's the same B, same IL, and the same B, and it's also the same angle. So remember, this angle here um, I'll call it alpha, just to, so it has a name, is 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians minus theta. Okay, so we know the direction of these is that one's plus y and that one's minus y, so we can work out what's the magnitude of the cross product of I, L, cross B. Well, we know that's going to be I times L times B, all those magnitudes, times the sine of the angle between them. And here is a thing, if you look at a triangle, if you call this theta, and you call this pi over two minus theta, which you know is right, because this is pi over two, this is 90 degrees, 
and the three angles of the triangle have to sum to 180 degrees, or to pi, so this plus this is pi over 2 plus pi over 2, right, so we get that. So this is your 90 degree or pi over 2 radian angle. So this is theta, this is pi over 2 theta. Well, um, if we call this side 1, then this divided by 1 is cosine theta. This divided by 1 is sine theta. But this divided by 1 is also cosine of pi over 2, or 90 degrees, minus theta. And this is opposite over hypotenuse for that angle, is sine of pi over 2 minus theta. So the, the whole reason I did all of that is just how do I figure this out? Well, I could just left it like that. But I'm going to turn it into ILB cosine theta because that's a little bit simpler. Okay, and then what is, well, that's the force, right? And both of these forces will have the same magnitude. What we really care about is the torque. Now you can see just looking at this that both these torques are going to try and spin it that way. So let's write down our lever arms um, in blue. So we're doing torques about the center of the loop of current. Right, so that's your lever arm. Its length is A over 2, right, because this current loop is A by A. And this lever arm is A over 2. Uh, that's good. This L here, I should have said, is just A, because that's the length of the whole wire, is A, right? In fact, what I'm going to do is replace this L with A, because that is the length of the wire. And we're good. Now, for the torque, um, the torque for each one of these is equal to the lever arm R cross F. So that is going to, well, that's that radius. All right, so again, let's just, I mean, I could do this by writing it in terms of components with X hats and Y hats and stuff, but let's do the magnitudes. R cross F, that's into the board. Here we have, I want to stand like this, R cross F, that's into the board. They're both into the board. A torque into the board will try to get the thing spinning this way, and good, that's the intuitive answer we get. So both of these are into the board. So what I'm going to get is the magnitude of the torque is RF times the sine of the angle between. And notice it's exactly the same alpha uh, between R and F that we were talking about with the... Uh... Okay, I have made an error. Of course, all this, all this argument I just made here, all that argument was for the lever arm and the force, because that's the one that has the angle um, pi over 2 minus theta between them. The magnetic field and the, the magnetic field that way in the z direction and the current in the x direction in both cases are actually perpendicular. So the magnitude is just that. We didn't have to have an angle on it. All right, so now let's go ahead and put these in. That's A over 2 is what the length of R is. The force is IAB times cosine theta. That's the torque from one of these, and the, so the net torque on this is going to equal, um, there's two of them, so we'll have a over 2 plus a over 2, it's going to be i, a times a, a squared b cosine theta. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Now, uh, so now we know what the magnitude of the torque is. Now there's a thing I want to point out, and that is if you remember the unit circle, right? So you have the unit circle, which is a circle of radius 1. If that angle is theta, then sine theta is equal to y, and cosine theta is equal to x. Or if this is a circle of radius r, it could be y over r and x over r, and then it's just a circle. But that also works for pretty much any angle, right? So I could draw this angle here, and we'll call that phi, right? And sine phi, let's call this y2 and x2, is equal to um, x2 over r, si oh, sorry, that's cosine phi is x2 over r, and sine phi is y2 over r. In this case, you can just see it, right? Because x is adjacent, adjacent over hypotenuse is x over r, so that's cosine. Here it's less obvious that, um, and sorry, phi is that whole angle, right? It's less obvious that this whole angle, because we don't have a triangle anymore, but with the unit circle it still does work. Well, okay, so looking at this, one thing that this tells us is that theta, that this whole thing will be greater than zero 
if um, minus 90 degrees is less than theta is less than 90 degrees. And, right, so that's what happens. That's when x is positive. And it'll be less than zero if theta is greater than 90 degrees, um, but then uh, less than 270 degrees. So that's what happens over here and here when x is negative. Okay, so keep that in mind and now what we're going to do. So we're going to look at this and make sure this math still works. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the movie and uh, back to the 3D animation. And so that you can see it, I'm going to erase all this stuff over here because that's what it's going to be in front of mostly. I'm going to leave this one here. I'm going to erase all this. Okay, we're going to go back to the animation and we're going to look and, and think about what happens as it's at different angles. Right, so remember the, the front and back legs don't matter. So we're just going to look at the top and bottom legs. And so you see here, here's the torque we just calculated. Uh, you've got the currents in the magnetic fields showing here. So here's the torques we just calculated. And so these are going to try and get it rotating sort of in this direction, like that. Now notice when it's, this is actually what I drew in class. When the magnetic field is lying within the plane of the loop, that's when the torque is strongest because the lever arm is perpendicular to the force. So it's still going to try and get it rotating like that. So let's keep going. Keep going. It'll go soon. I'm pretty confident. There we go, right. And in fact, all the way down, the force keeps yeah, trying to make it torque faster and faster and faster and faster until it gets horizontal. And now look, you see that the two forces on the edge are just trying to pull the thing apart. It is no longer, um, it's, it's no longer a torque because the lever arm is parallel to the force. So you have zero torque here. Well, that's kind of interesting. This is also a theta of minus 90. So the torque has been positive. If we go a bigger theta, that's theta more negative than minus 90, now notice that the torque is in the opposite direction. And all the way along, we're going to keep rotating this thing, all the way along, it's trying to get it to spin back the other way. Or if you look at what the thing, so up, originally it was in the minus x direction, now the torque makes it want to spin in the plus x direction. So if it's already spinning in the minus x, it'll slow it down. So you see once the loop is turned over, and now it's turned over because notice that the current is coming, uh, is coming out on the right and going in on the left. Now that it has turned over, well I guess that's what it was before, but now that it's turned all the way over and it's bent a little bit down from horizontal, it wants to go the other way. So I'm going to bring it back to where we started, and now let's just think about what happens. As the thing goes forward, there's going to be a positive torque. So let's just suppose it starts at this theta, whatever this theta is. It's something between 0 and 90 as specified. So it starts at this angle, and there is a torque in that minus x direction that's going to get it to start spinning. So it will. It'll start spinning any moment here. I, uh, spin, please. Spin. Spin. I am telling you to spin. Spin. Thank you. Right. And see, so here's what happens. So for the first spin from here to here, it's accelerating forward. But once it passes through the flat, now it's spinning in the minus x direction, right, like that, but the torque is in the plus x, so it pulls it back, and the whole thing just oscillates back and forth after that, which is what will happen if there's no friction at all, which might lead you to wonder, well, how does an electric motor work and keep things spinning in one direction at all? It's like, hmm, maybe we need an AC current, aha. Uh -huh. Anyway, this is what you get in this problem. In the third problem, we have two long wires carrying current I in the same direction. So there's an I, there's an I, and they are a distance D apart. What is the force per length on one of the two wires? Well, all right, force per length. Okay, not that hard a concept, but maybe a little weird. So what I'm going to start with is just saying, what is the force on a length L of the wires? And then we'll see what to do. So we'll start here if we have this length L of this wire and the same length L of this wire. What's the force on the wires? Well, what forces could there be? Well, there could be gravity, but we're going to forget about gravity. Um, gravity is probably that way and it's sitting at a table and we're not going to worry about it. Um, is there an electric force? Well, there's no net charge, right? There's charges moving. I mean, there's electrons going that way and there's all the nuclei, but there's no net charge, so there won't be an electric attraction. All that's left is the magnetic field. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at it. Here's an eyeball, right? I'm going to look at it from this point of view. And what we've got is the current here and a current here. And they are a distance d apart. And we know from uh, what we did before, what we did in class, is that you can cheat a little bit and point your thumb along this. The magnetic field is going to go around here. So this is the B. Let's call this wire 1 and this wire 2. This is the magnetic field of wire 1 at the position of wire 2. Why do we care about that? Well, if you do a I L cross B, you're going to see, hey, look, wire 2 is going to have a force that way. So already we know they're going to be attractive. If we had done it the other way, so this guy is going to have a magnetic field that curls around like this. So here is B2. And if I do IL of 1 cross B2, so the magnetic field of 2 acts on current 1, it's going to go that way. The force is going to go that way. So they're both, so they're going to be pulled towards each other, is what we expect. OK, that's interesting. So what is the strength of the force? Well, we have to start by figuring out, let's just do this bottom one. B1 is equal to um, is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi d. And I'm going to define x, y, z like that. Right? So here, that is z in this picture. And that is y. And then for this to work, x cross y is z. x has to be into the board. All right, and then so since I'm drawing the vector, B1 has to be in the x hat direction. Now, I didn't get that from the formula, because the formula I gave you only has the magnitude. But I also told you that the direction is around the wire. Well, at this position, right, when you're directly below the wire, around is in that way. And so that's how I just figured out it was x, just the right hand rule to figure out that that is x. And so now the force on number two, so this is, means the magnetic field in, in this problem. This is not a universal notation here. I mean, that's the magnetic field of number one. This is the force on number two, is I L vector cross um, B1. So I is given, what's L vector? Well, L vector, we're just going to say that's the force on this length of the wire. Right? This is number one, and this is number two here. The force on that length of the wire. And you notice L is in the z hat direction. So that's I L z hat cross mu naught I over 2 pi d x hat. Pull all the scalars out front. I get mu naught I squared L over 2 pi d z hat cross x hat, which z hat cross x hat is just y hat. You could do that here, right? Um, z hat cross x hat is y hat. So this is mu naught L, I'm rearranging it for no good reason, I squared over 2 pi d y hat. All right, that is the force on this wire. If I had done the force on this wire, all this would have been the same, because it's the same d. L would have been in the plus z direction still, but b would have been in the minus x direction, so I would have gotten a force in the minus y hat direction. So I can't just quote a force. So there's two ways if I wanted to write this down accurately. I could say, um, actually, since I didn't give you coordinates, the best way to say is that force is equal mu naught i squared L over 2 pi d towards the other wire. So I've given you the magnitude and the direction of force. And that is, um, that's the third problem. I'm going to dive right into the fourth problem because the current in one of the two wires is reversed. What happens? So here's this. This is not much of a modification. I'm just going to turn this current around here. So now it's going that way. So now this current here is into the board. This magnetic field is still the same, but this magnetic field is now different, right? Because now that it's into the board, at the top it curls around to the right. So this becomes B2 there. And of course, I1 is still ooh, mixing. It's like doing playing with the uh, watercolors. I1 is still sticking out of the board. Well, OK, so I2, when I did F2, I2 is now in the minus z hat direction. Ooh, oh, I got pink on this. In the minus z hat direction. So this would have been minus z. Well, I can pull the minus out front as part of the scalars. So this would have come out as minus that y hat, right down. 
Well, and I could have done the same thing with the right hand rule. I, L, and so the board cross B is that way. And if I do it up here, I, L cross B is that way. And now the answer to number four is away from the other wire. Right, all the, the magnitude of the force turns out to be exactly the same because none of the letters that went none of the letters, none of the algebra that went into the magnitude would have changed. The only thing that changes is the direction of the forces which you work out with the right hand roll. Right, so that's interesting. Two wires that are parallel, it looks like will um, uh, attract each other, and two wires with opposite currents will repel. Don't memorize that. Be able to figure it out because I might ask you slightly trickier questions. All right, that's it for this week.